Um, I talked about how this in some ways reminds me of one of my favorite parts of the job, um, and that is as an educator, being able to make a difference in people's lives. Well, the second part of my job that I truly enjoy is getting to know our alums and members of this community. It is my tremendous pleasure to be able to introduce here in a minute today's convocation speaker, uh, Jerry Hirsch. And Jerry is a graduate of the law school, but he is far more than that. Um, he really is an individual who represents so much more than just what you can do with a law degree. He represents an individual for whom legal training and legal education has made a real difference, I think, in every part of his life. And then you look at the difference he's made in his community and frankly throughout the world, he's a true inspiration. Jerry is not just um, a graduate of the law school, he is the founder of the Lodestar Foundation, which has consistently been ranked one of the most influential foundations in the country, despite having really just pennies to the dollar compared to many others because of the difference that he makes. Now those of you who don't know, Lodestar has a particular meaning. Um, and the one that I, it has a number of meanings, but it has a particular meaning that I think makes a real difference to all of us. And that is, is it's a shining example. That the Lodestar is a particular example of something that pretends either a much richer or deeper uh, experience once you find it and once you follow it. And in that sense, I think Jerry really is a Lodestar alum of this law school. Talking about how you use legal training to truly make a difference in people's lives every single day is something I hope he's gonna speak about today. I hope it resonates with all of you, and I hope it ties into your entire careers. And so, as I said, one of my absolute favorite parts of the job is meeting our alums, and I think my favorite part so far has been meeting Jerry. And so without further ado, Jerry, come on up. Well, thank you so much, Dean Sylvester. Uh, those are very kind words. Uh, I have to say, initially, I was a little bit, I've been a little bit overwhelmed uh, a few moments before the ceremony being in the Dean Room because I didn't anticipate uh, the joy that radiated the entire room and the joy that I feel here today. It's really uh, a very special privilege to even be a tiny part of, of this uh, ceremony. Um, the way uh, I've been asked, I've been told that the way to start a talk like this is to tell a, jo a lawyer joke. <laughs> but um, I will take the lead of uh, former Justice uh, William Rehnquist, who stopped telling lawyer jokes uh, because whenever he told a lawyer joke, the lawyers in the audience didn't like it and the others didn't know it was a joke. <laughs> as I mentioned, I really consider it an honor to be speaking to you today. As Dean Sylvester mentioned, this law school means so much to me, it dramatically changed my life. Besides learning about the law and a new way of thinking, it gave me a sense of self-confidence and self-respect. To a large degree, I contribute uh, virtually everything I've done, every success I've had since then to my law school experience. Although I didn't realize most of it for many years later. One thing I didn't learn at law school, however, is how a lawyer could lead a happy life. And I'll spend uh, a few moments this afternoon telling you what I learned this later on in my life about this. In preparing for this talk, I found that, uh, to my surprise actually, that lawyers are generally not a very happy group. As you may know, lawyers suffer greater suicide rates, divorce rates, and rates of alcohol and substance abuse than most other groups. Lawyers have elevated rates of anxiety, hostility, paranoia, obsessive compulsiveness, and they suffer far more from depression. There are so many lawyers who suffer from depression. There's a website for them, www.lawyerswithdepression.com. <laughs> and as a group, they are in poor health and lawyers even get into more automobile accidents than most other groups. Now, before you begin your law career by suing the law school, Dean Sylvester, <laughs> for getting you into this emotionally miserable and physically deadly profession. 
you should know that these negative characteristics are about lawyers generally. And they don't, they're not necessarily about you. The degree of your happiness and well-being as a lawyer depends greatly on the choices you make as an individual. A study published earlier this year surveyed more than 5,000 lawyers in four different states and compared the well-being and life satisfaction, the level of happiness of lawyers who have made different career choices. Their main finding was that graduating law school students who are primarily motivated in seeking a career and what the researchers said were intrinsic values, such as finding work that was interesting, engaging, personally meaningful, and focused on providing help to others, were ultimately much happier than those students primarily motivated by extrinsic values, such as prestige, affluence, and compensation. They also drank less. They also found that those working for public service firms were happier than those working for prestige firms, even though the latter made more money and lived a more prosperous lifestyle. That those working for relatively small firms were happier than those working for larger firms. Those with more autonomy were happier than those that were more supervised. Those with more authenticity, those who were able to incorporate their inner values in their work, were happier than those who weren't. Those who were not required to achieve monthly minimum billable hours were happier, obviously, than those who were. But those who, in addition to working minimum billable hours, who worked more pro bono hours, <coughs> were happier than those who didn't. And older lawyers were generally happier than younger ones, I guess because they mostly paid off their student debt. <laughs> I should add, for those of you who may be primarily motivated by a future large income, that there are many lawyers, usually partners in large firms, who have managed to combine, combine affluence and privilege with personal happiness. But in relative terms, there are very few of them, and it's a long haul. One recent study found that the satisfaction threshold, the compensation level, at which lawyers are fi those lawyers are finally satisfied with the income they achieve is about $500,000 a year. And that's about more than, three and a, more than three times what the average lawyer made last year. So that, so that climb is very, very long. And that's another example of how overall, how happy a lawyer might be is determined not by the profession itself, but by the choices he, and she, he or she makes. Now my law career was very limited. I only worked for about three years. I worked as an associate for what is now called big law. However, during the almost 50 years that I spent in a variety of businesses in the social, se the social sector, I worked with many, many lawyers of many different kinds, some of whom become close friends of mine. And although I spent the last 18 years in the area of philanthropy. In my journey to philanthropy, I wound up learning some lessons that I believe may be very helpful to you in making the choices you'll face. And I'll spend a moment talking about my journey. My journey started when I was 48 years old. I thought at that time I was a happily married guy. I had six kids, they were doing well, and my business was highly successful. And then my wife suddenly left me and I went into a deep, life-threatening depression, and I was locked inside of a hospital room. My kids, who were mostly in college, told me that they were okay and I should think about myself. And because I'd been near death, I started thinking about my legacy. What should be written in my, bio, uh, my autobiography? How would I be remembered after I die? Sure, I'd be remembered as a devoted and loving father, but what about the rest of my life. I've been mostly in the shopping center business. So maybe my obituary might read that before there was Hirsch, there were 463 shopping centers in Arizona, and now there are 521. Is that what I want to be remembered by? No, I needed something more. 
I wanted something more to be remembered by. I had to do something more meaningful in my life. Well, I immediately then decided I'd quit my business and I'd do something else, but I didn't know what it was. Because I'd been so isolated in my hotel room, my hospital room, it wasn't like a hotel room at all. <laughs> uh, to help occupy my time, I'd written down all my thoughts on pad after pad after pad. They were actually yellow pads. I don't know whether you still use them or not. Um, after a couple of days, I, I had an epiphany. I, I, I would pursue a career as a writer. My depression soon eased. I got out of the hospital, and I enrolled at ASU in courses in literature and creative writing. One day, about six months into my studies, a literature course studied the uh, great English poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her poem, How Many, Way uh, How Many Ways I Love Thee, Let Me Count the Ways. I think most, many of you are familiar with the poem. That day, after class, during lunch, I had lunch with one of my old real estate buddies. And he very excitedly told me that he just made $400,000 in a real estate deal. Well, in my prior life, that would be pretty impressive. That's a ton of money. But then all I could think of was that poem. And all I could think of was if I could choose between being the poet who had written that poem and had created a poem that for hundreds of years, lovers, thousands of lovers have used to recite their love for each other, or be that real estate guy who made $400,000, which would I choose? What if I could make a million dollars or a hundred million dollars? Well, for the first time in my life, I identified something that maybe I could do personally that was more important than money. Well, a little later I found out that because of a lack of talent, I couldn't be a poet. I had to figure out something else, but I can sit on it. Then an acquaintance of mine gave me a book called Man's Search for Meaning, written by uh, Viktor Frankl. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the book, uh, Viktor Frankl was a, a Jewish-Austrian psychiatrist who was interned in concentration camps during World War II. And when he got to the concentration camp, he noticed something he thought was curious. He found that some of the very old, frail inmates lived longer than some of the young, stronger ones. And he didn't understand that, he studied that. And he found that there was something more important in life than food or water or shelter. It was having a purpose in life. He found that those who had a deep passion and focused purpose for wanting to stay alive, maybe they needed to finish writing a book or needed to finish teaching their students or needed to stay alive to be at their daughter's wedding live longer than those who didn't. He observed one inmate who, even though he had little to eat, would find strangers who were dying of starvation and give them some few crumbs of food he had. And Franco realized that that was a purpose the man had given himself for needing to stay alive. What I finally realized was that the deeper one's purpose in life, the more meaningful one's life, the happier and more satisfying one's life becomes. And if one decides to have a purpose to help others, the more you help, the more meaningful and happier your life. So I became a philanthropist, not because of any altruism, not because I wanted to give back, but because I selfishly wanted to have a happier life. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, it's one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. That's how I view my passion to pursue philanthropy. I wanted to help myself for, to a happy life, and that's why I try to help others. Now you might think, what has this got to do with you? A leading National Lawyers Employment Service conducted a survey last year of 300 of the, of the largest law firms and corporations in North America. They asked the question, what is your primary concern? The number one response to look from the lawyers was not the answer you might think. Not compensation or stability or career growth. It was concern about their not doing meaningful work. And a law firm consultant 
commenting on why the profession of lawyer didn't make Forbes' recent uh, list of the 25 most meaningful jobs that pay well, concluded that it was a sad reminder that a great and noble profession isn't living up to its potential for generating purpose and well-being for its practici practitioners. One con contributor to this failure appears to be the loss of meaning and purpose. So I want to offer you three suggestions on finding a meaningful life as a lawyer. Suggestions gleaned mostly from my experience working with lawyers over the last 50 years and using lessons I learned from my philanthropy journey. The three suggestions are one, be an advisor, not a hired gun. Two, don't compromise your ethics. And three, pursue your higher purpose. Be an advisor. Giving advice is generally an essential but often ignored aspect of being a true lawyer. Candid advice, which sometimes a client may not like to hear, and which may include related moral, economic, social, or other issues. Now, I'm mentioning this to you now, even though you're just starting out, so you'll remember the importance of your role as an advisor as your legal expertise and competence grows. A primary area where lawyers fail is in fail to give advice is in litigation. According to a prominent psychologist, the deepest of all psychological factors making lawyers unhappy is that American law is becoming increasingly a win-loss game in which billable hours take no prisoner victories and the bottom line are now the principal ends. And in the wor words of one legal commentator, courtroom victories might be the result of effective legal work. But being a good lawyer is so much more. As a profession, we place too much emphasis on being zealous advocates and too little on being good counselors. A lawyer, for example, who truly represents his client might explain to his client the potential cost of time and money to litigate, and that maybe instead the lawyer could just have lunch with opposing counsel to try to settle the matter, or that while he could compet com competently handle the matter, a lawyer at another firm is far more experienced in that specialized area, or that while the client has a real legal right to do something from a moral per per perspective, the lawyer thinks it's a lousy thing to do. In that last situation, you should remember that for a lawyer to keep silent on a client's moral position is, in fact, taking a moral position. And in all these examples, the lawyer may be losing fees, but be more richly rewarded in the satisfaction of knowing he truly represents his client. And indeed, it ultimately might lead to a much closer, more trusted representation of his client and far more fees down the road. Finally, using the obituary test I use in my hospital room, you might ask yourself whether you'd rather be known or remembered for the number of notches on your gun belt, the number of your courtroom victories, like the number of the shopping centers I built, or your billable hours and the money you made as a result, or for the advice you gave to your clients, which dramatically bettered their lives. Digressing for just a moment, I might be criticized here for suggesting you use this obituary test when as young people, you're sure you'll live forever. But the obituary test can be a very valuable tool. Think of Alfred Nobel. For those of you who don't know the story, Nobel was the inventor of dynamite, and when his brother died, a newspaper thought that Alfred died and wrote his obituary criticizing his legacy of dynamite. Nobel read the obituary, didn't like it at all, and that's why he created the Nobel Prize. So even if you never think about death, maybe once a year when they announce the Nobel Prizes, you might remember to check the direction of your legal career and of your life. Next is don't compromise your ethics. You've all taken a course or in legal ethics where you study the rules of professional conduct. But as you know, those rules mandate only the outer boundaries of what you cannot and what must, must do. Within those boundaries, decisions generally 
rest within the domain of your personal sense of right and wrong. As a new lawyer under pressure from your client or boss, you might be tempted to use the code, as some lawyers have, as a cop-out, as an excuse to act unethically where the code doesn't specifically prohibit those acts. Or interpret the should or shouldn't in the code, primarily based on how it might favor your, your case as opposed to your sense of right and wrong. Then there's the pressure of padding billable hours. This is understandable, since the amount of annual billable hours lawyers are usually asked to attain has risen from 1,300 hours in the 1950s to 2,000 and more or more today. Yet even minor padding is going down the proverbial slippery slope, and even if no one ever finds out about it, you will know, and that will make a meaningful life, a happy life, far more difficult to attain. Since most, ethic, since most law schools teach what has been described as legal ethics without the ethics, although I'm sure this does not apply to ASU, I recently asked several prominent legal authorities to recommend a short one-sentence test of what is or isn't ethical. Here's what they said. Number one legal authority, of course, is Dean Sylvester. He says, use a golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Number two, Judge Andy Hurwitz in the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals. Yes, the golden rule works, but it sounds too stuffy. My version is, don't do it if it would piss you off if the other guy did. <laughs> Kyle Hirsch, an ASU law school graduate who's practiced for 10 years and is a partner with a, a major law firm, and is one of my sons. Do it only if you'd be ashamed to tell your grandmother what you did. Well, I guess Kyle thinks is, I'm a bigger prude than his grandmother. <laughs> professor Michael Birch, who former professor at the law school, Smell it, and if it smells, beware, and more than likely, stay away from it. And Rebecca Birch, former Chief Justice with the Arizona Supreme Court. Think of what you, th what you thought would be ethical or unethical before you ever went to law school. <laughs> Judge Hurwitz also asked me that when I talk to you about ethics, I include civility and professionalism. These are all bedrock requirements for being a happy lawyer. And finally, follow your, follow your higher purpose. One of the primary results of the survey I mentioned to you at the beginning of this talk was that many students enter law school motivated by those intrinsic values, compassion, wanting to serve others, but that by the time they graduate, they've converted to having a primary motivation of extrinsic values, such as prestige or making money or influence. As I mentioned earlier, only a tiny fraction of lawyers have or will become rich financially, and most lawyers motivated but primarily by financial rewards will be quite disappointed. However, you can be rich in many, many other ways, in other ways. I earlier mentioned writing a poem and comparing it to making a lot of money. When I practiced law, one of my bosses was a man named John Frank. Before I ever met him, John had, among other momentous legal achievements, represented a criminal defendant named Ernesto Miranda in the United States Supreme Court, resulting, as you know, in the ubiquitous Miranda warnings. So instead of writing a poem, could you name the amount of money you would want? If you had to decide between the money and having been the lawyer responsible for the Miranda warning, which has been such a universal fundamental right. Then think of Larry Hammond, a partner in a law firm that used to represent me. Beyond his normal practice, Larry heads up the Arizona Justice Project, whereby so far it has freed 24 wrongly convicted prisoners. I asked Larry whether if he had a choice, he would rather have been a wealthy businessman. He responded, that's not even an issue. Being a lawyer has been so rewarding. I feel blessed. He also says he felt particularly blessed for being able to work with some of you, some of the enthusiastic ASU law students who work on this project. 
How much money would you rather have than having done what Larry has done? These two men demonstrate that being a lawyer can make you richer than any business entrepreneur. It all comes down to our common goal of seeking happiness. Then think of Neil Curran. Neil never argued a case before the Supreme Court or freed any innocent prisoners. He's my estate lawyer. Neil describes his work like being the old time family doctor. He told me clients share with me their feelings about their family members, what is important to them, what truly concerns them. I call Neil about 6 p.m. on a Sunday evening. He is 81 and was still working. I asked him whether he'd rather be a multimillionaire, and he told me he'd turned down an opportunity for a Harvard MBA, and he wouldn't trade his current life for anything. He's been recognized many times for his civic and charitable pro bono work. Like the Garth Brothers refrain, you aren't wealthy until you have something that money can't buy. I'm sure that Bill Gates' life is not any more meaningful than Neil's, and I'm confident there are thousands of lawyers who are just as, also just as happy, lawyers who follow their inner values and lead a meaningful life. And maybe that's why Neil is so robust at his age. Recent studies show that those who have a purpose in life involving values such as caring, compassion, and helping others have many benefits over the average person. They're able to more easily change their lifestyle, such as stopping smoking or drug or alcohol addiction. They've got a better well-being, such as being happier, having better sleep, and even better sex. And they are more able to avoid major illness and live longer. The namesake of our law school, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, when asked the secret of happiness, said simply to do work worth doing. You're all about to have the opportunity to do work worth doing. If you make the right choices, you will be a happy lawyer. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Just very quickly, we're a public institution, so they're small, but thank you very much. <laughs> Once again, incredibly inspiring words, Jerry. Thank you. I think you see why it's been such a pleasure for me to get to know Jerry, and I hope many of you get a chance to know him as well. Uh, before we move on with the ceremony, a couple of quick observations. Uh, like a typical lawyer, my health is terrible and I drink too much, but I, I don't know if I was hallucinating, but I swear during your speech somebody was whistling, don't worry, be happy. And if anybody else heard that, please nod or I think I'm hallucinating. Thank you, you heard it as well. Very strange moment in my life. Another quick observation, it's the only time in my life I am positive that Judge Andy Hurwitz will ever beat me on the low pretension scale, so please tell him I said that. And the third thing that I, don't, I, I think you probably don't know is I just found out today that Jerry was actually the first December graduate the law school ever had. He graduated earlier than any of his classmates, and we didn't even have a December convocation back then. So welcome to your true December convocation, Jerry, and thank you again.